Okay, so in considering tonight's doctrine, I really, um, looking into these doctrines, it just, what I kept coming up with was different passages of Scripture that are so largely misunderstood or avoided. So how many of you, um, in all honesty, like skip some passages of the Bible because... Or you're afraid somebody might ask you about this certain passage of the Bible and you'd be like, yeah, I don't know why God does that, right? Yeah, I I don't, you know. um, So we're going to get into some of those tonight. And so tonight is called Solving Bible Difficulties. And it's, I have four of the more scary or more commonly avoided uh, passages of Scripture that... Uh, I've heard mistaught many, many times. I've heard excuses made for God. Imagine that. Apologizing for God, making excuses for God, things like that. Um, So I'm going to cover those topics. And if you have the notes, you see the first story is from 2 Kings 2. I'm actually going to finish with that story. Um, And if you're wondering why and you figure it out, let me know because I'm not sure. But I just feel like I should. So, uh, we're going to actually start with the James 2 patch passage, um, is where, we'll be, we, where we will begin. So, let's pray and, and we'll start from there. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to you, God, and uh, thank you for the day behind us, Lord. We pray that you found us faithful. We pray, Lord, that you forgive our sins. And Lord, we pray for the evening ahead of us, Lord, that we would uh, just hold you in the highest of esteem. Lord, just to catch a glimpse of what Isaiah saw of your robe filling the temple and the angels singing your your holiness and and God, just you would give your people just more of a vision of just how amazing you are. And Lord, we pray that would result in our obedience to you always. So God, uh, give us grace, we pray for tonight and may this just be an incredible hour spent where, Lord, uh, both your kingdom in heaven is pleased and your kingdom on earth is fed, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, I'm going to start with a few guidelines on how to handle difficult Bible passages. Four things that I think are very, very helpful as you encounter difficulties with stories. Stories that make God look, as Richard Dawkins would say, as a monster, or as a, um, that he violates his own commands for morality, uh, things like that, or things that may appear contradictory. Um, We are going to start with a passage that has been accused of being a major, major contradiction, and we're going to show how to understand uh, these passages. So the first tip I have in dealing with difficult Bible passages, first is this. Believe in the authenticity of these stories and their authors. In other words, these stories didn't happen last generation and we're trying to figure out if we can trust them or not. These have been tried and studied under microscopes more than any other body of literature in the history of literature. These things have been scrutinized over and over and over and over and over again and nobody can cancel these stories out. Nobody can find any way to not uh, disprove the historicity and the reality of any of these stories. And it's not from lack of trying. Um, You get into things like, uh, you know, people struggling with the flood, you know, despite uh, the fossil evidence and the geological columns. And these are things that their only explanation is a flood. And yet, people, and and some of it I think is our fault, because when I look at Sunday school, what they do with kids, and I look at even Christian schools and what they do with the really young kids, all these stories are in coloring books, and the coloring books are so misdrawn that when the kids get older, they're like, well, that couldn't be real. You know, Noah's Ark, like animals literally hanging over the edge for dear life and things like that. Uh, Then they grow up and they go, I don't believe that. Well, either do I. And so we need to make sure kids get these stories truthfully and accurately, not fantastically. But 
What's one thing about Old Testament stories that help you to trust in their reality? Well, first of all, you start with this, okay? I always start with this. I start with Jesus' tomb was found empty. There is no atheistic scholar that will deny that. Nobody says his body is in that tomb, and you know that. Nobody says that. So the agreement's on the empty tomb, and when you come up for explanations of how it got empty, you'll see literally it takes more faith to believe in the alternate explanations than in the explanation that he rose from the dead. There's, there's so many, it, it, it's just, if we went through them, you would see we're not going to spend time going through them. Um, we can go do that another time. But <clears throat> because the tomb is empty, that means Jesus rose from the dead. That means the man has credibility in the things that he's said. And one of the things Jesus said is this, uh, regarding his second coming, which that's a really big deal, right? Jesus said it'll be like the days of Noah. People were eating and drinking, being married and given in marriage when suddenly the flood came. So Jesus relies on no other information at all except the flood of Noah to give credibility to a very important event he needs people to believe in, his second coming. He told many parables to prepare people for that second coming. With all that he had at stake for people believing in his second coming, the only thing he would give us as proof was it's like the days of Noah and the flood. So why would I believe in the flood besides the scientific evidence? It's this, the credibility of the man who rose from the dead believes in it, okay? That's major. Second thing Jesus Christ believed in that many people don't like to give credibility to is that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Yet Jesus' third day resurrection is even more important than his second coming because without him rising from the dead on the third day, it ain't no big deal he comes back ever again. The third day resurrection, everything hinges on that. Paul says, if that's not true, then our entire faith is in vain and we're to be pitied more than all people, right? So the only, credi- the only thing Jesus uses for the credibility that will rise on the third day is he says, like the prophet Jonah who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So Jesus Christ puts all of the eggs in one basket on his important third day resurrection. He says, it's just like Jonah. He puts all the credibility for his second coming on one event, the flood. The two most major events, his resurrection and his second coming, are on passages that people just find hard to believe. And I'm reminded of the uh, conversation between a teacher and a second grader about Jonah. After teaching on the digestive systems of fish, she could say, she said, so you would see that a fish could never swallow a man. And the little boy said, no, I think Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And she says, no, it's not possible. And he says, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. And the teacher said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And the boy said, well, then you ask him. (laughs) All right. Anyways. Now, so believe in the authenticity of the stories and their authors. Two, context is critical for understanding. As you'll see in the first example I give in the faith and works debate, uh, Catholics will stand very strong on James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. But when you look at what Paul is saying very clearly from that passage, we're about to cover it, you'll see in the context it is not a works-based salvation passage at all. It's quite the opposite. It's very much a faith alone passage. So, context is critical for understanding. Three, commentaries and Greek and Hebrew lexicons should always be used. Without knowing the meanings of original words, we get very, very lost very, very quickly. So, if you're not taking Greek and Hebrew, you should be reading commentaries from people who have and use the Greek and Hebrew to express why they feel the way they feel about a passage. And four, the best interpreter of Scripture is? There you go. We use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Why would you use anybody else besides an inspired author who's commented on the same passage? Okay, so we use Scripture to 
interpret scripture. When we do that, we see the scriptures harmonize. They harmonize when we use scripture to interpret scripture. If you don't use scripture to interpret scripture, then you're leaving the world of inspired authors and going to the uninspired uh, people and their opinions on the text. And that's a, a, quite the drop off from using the inspired writers. With those four points, <laughs> let's put them to use. And we'll start in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. So I'm going to read it through. And after reading it through, we'll discuss the problem and the solution. James 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, if we're totally honest, we read that through we find it sounds like a very good argument that works are necessary for salvation, doesn't it? Sounds that way, okay? But let's take a look at what uh, Paul is actually saying here. So I read it through just so you hear how it sounds. Now let's go and pick it apart a little. Now, first of all, the same uh, people contrast James now, and they'll say James contradicts the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10 says... You are saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, so that no one can boast. And then he goes on in the next verse to say, For you are Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So Paul clearly says there, you're saved by grace through faith alone, not of works. But then he says, you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So he says the works were not a part of your salvation. You're saved by grace through faith alone, but those, that faith will always be accompanied by good works, always. Okay? So I believe it was Martin Luther that said, you are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. It's always accompanied by works. Always accompanied by works. That's why Jesus said, make the tree good. That's your salvation. And good trees bear good fruit, okay? They will always bear good fruit. So without the fruit, which Jesus says, you will know who are mine by their fruit. It's the fruit that gives you a way that you're saved. It didn't save you, okay? So let me word it this way before I tear apart James 2 here. Works are the outward indication. Let me say it again. Works are the outward visible indication of the inward invisible faith that you have, okay? Works are the outward visible manifestation of the invisible faith that you have internally. All right, now, and they go together always. Now, Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he says, work out. And he doesn't mean works with that word work. He means exercise your faith. Do the things of your faith. Exercise it out. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. Why? He says, because God works in you to will. That's the word want, to create a will and a want in you. To will, to, uh, to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
Okay, so in other words, what does salvation do according to Paul in Philippians? It creates a want to for the works, okay? So he's working a will, willingness in you to do good works for the kingdom of God, okay? So he says you better be exercising your faith because if you don't, then what does that say about God working that will in you? You must be, if you're truly saved, and some reason you're suppressing that will. Why would you do that? when you actually want to do the good works. The promise is you're going to want to serve the kingdom of God uh, when you're authentically saved. And then Romans 3.8, same thought, different audience. Uh, Romans 3.8 says, I'm sorry, it's Romans 3.28 I love when I say a verse wrong, look at the wrong verse and go, I have no idea why I picked that verse. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. But it's Romans 3, 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So Paul is crystal clear on it. So what is James then saying <clears throat> that's not at all contradictory, but rather supportive of Paul? So he says back in 14, what is a profit if somebody says he has faith but does not have works? The key is what does it profit? Can faith save him? This is faith apart from works. Is that a saving faith is the question. And you'll see in a moment, he compares that type of faith to the faith of demons. He'll say demons have that same type of faith. Ask a demon if Jesus is Lord. He will say yes, and he will shudder, as this says. Okay? Demons have less doubt about faith in God than you and I have. They have certainty about him. Okay? So James is saying, you need to have better faith in demons, okay? Because if you only intellectually assent to Christ as Lord, and it's only intellectual for you, you're on the level of demons. They do the same thing, and they have no fruit. They have no good works. So this is what's being fought against in this passage. So he says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Remember, many people come to Jesus on Judgment Day and say, didn't I? And they give a list of good works that they performed. And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Right? So they went there with their good works and, and, and said, this is why you should let me in. Now, does, are you saved by good works? No. No. If you were saved by good works, Jesus would go, that's very impressive. Oh my gosh, how could I possibly deny you, you who are filled with good works? But they're denied because that's all they had was good works and no authentic faith. Okay? So, so thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. So now here's the parallel. He, said, show, he says, uh, show me your faith without works. In verse 18, the parallel is the beginning of 19. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even demons believe and tremble. So he's matching, hey, you show, you're showing your faith without works. Well, that's what even the demons do. Okay, so that's the parallel he's drawn in those two verses. Um, but do you want to know a foolish man that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now, this is why this passage gets confusing. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? The word justified here is not the justification unto salvation. This is not that justification. This means, doesn't this work of Abraham justify the fact that he's authentically saved? In other words, this word justification here is being used as verified. Doesn't it verify his faith? It justifies that he's claiming to have authentic faith. Okay? So he's saying, Was not Abraham our father justified by his works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And here's why I know that's true. Watch how, watch how James unpacks this. He says, Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, ready for this, his faith was made perfect. In other words, what's the saving faith? It's, it's a perfected faith. And what perfects faith? It's a faith that says, I have the will to do good now. I have the will to work for the kingdom of God now. And it, now those works authenticate your salvation. Works 
to a believer is in the same relationship as miracles were to a prophet. How did somebody know if a prophet was a genuine prophet? God enabled those prophets to do miracles. Even Jesus as a prophet said, if you don't believe in my words, at least believe based on the miracles I'm doing. The miracles authenticated the messenger, okay? Good works authenticate the true believer, okay? So let's see him unpack this even more. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So it says when he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar, that justified his claim of being a true believer. And therefore, it says um, it, 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 the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God. So, so what's the fulfilling of Abraham's belief in God? He did that work of being willing to sacrifice his son. That's fulfilling his belief. He says he believes, and then with that claim of saying he believes, he's willing to obey God even to that extent. Okay, how many of you follow Jordan Peterson? All right. <laughs> I'm fascinated by his spiritual journey. I'm captivated by it. Because one thing he understands better than anybody I ever met, that when you ask him if he believes in God, he really struggles with that answer to the point of tears. And he says he struggles with it because he'll say, who could ever say they believe in God? Because belief insinuates obedience. And God is the greatest possible morality. Who could ever say they're following that? So he gets the connection very clearly and shudders at the implications. What he doesn't seem to understand is forgiveness. He understands who he's talking about, the morally supreme being that calls you to be morally supreme. And you're to be like him, holy as he is holy and, and perfect as he is perfect. And so he's saying if you believe that, it should be so evident in how you're living your life. So who could ever claim that? Because who could ever see somebody doing that? Again, he's right on that, but, but the wall he's hitting is that's our standard, but we also realize we can't possibly meet it, and that's what draws us to Christ for forgiveness. So he's just missing that second half of the story there. All right. And the script, scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified, verified, proven by works and not by faith only because if it's faith only and there's no works you have the faith of what demons so the works is what shows that you don't have that demonic faith that just says i know jesus is lord but it doesn't impact me in any way that changes my behavior okay likewise was not rahab the harlot also justified was her faith not proven by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So just as the body without the spirit is dead, it says if you claim an intellectual understanding of Christ and who he is without works, you're missing the spirit of your intellectual understanding. The spirit of it is you're going to be a person who produces for the kingdom. Okay? Through loving God and loving others and then letting the chips fall where they may from your love of God and love of others and see what fruit that produces. Okay, so I was convinced that would be the shortest one of the night, and it's taken half the class. So we're in big trouble, folks. All right. All right, so I'm going to go to Jephthah's vow, Judges chapter 11. I've heard this destroyed by people. The good news is, is People like to skip over it and not teach it because it's hard to understand. And, um, but I'll tell you what I hear normally taught from this is Judges 11. What I normally hear taught from this is, this is why you don't make rash vows. Okay? So I'll read through the story. It's probably the least known of the different topics I'm covering tonight. So let me read it through. Um, so this judge of Israel named Jephthah is called to go to battle 
and he asks God that he says he makes a deal with God, a vow to God, and this is what it sounds like. The spirit. This is uh, Joshua eleven twenty nine. I'm sorry, Judges eleven twenty nine. Judges eleven twenty nine. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mitzpah of Gilead, and from Mitzpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon will surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Okay, first thing is this. I've heard people say he was clearly expecting an animal, and that's why he was willing to offer it up as a burnt offering. Do you really think when you're coming home from a journey... It's going to be an animal that comes out and greets you, especially because they didn't like dogs. They didn't have dogs as pets. They despised dogs. So is some cow going to go, oh, look who's back, right, and run out and get him? We're to understand he expects a person here, somebody excited to see him come home, somebody he cares about and cares about him, okay? Now, this word and, it says... Surely, it says, uh, when I return in peace from the people of Amnon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. That word and is easily translated as or, by the way. Okay? So some of your versions may even have that. It could be or I will offer it up as a burnt offering. All right. Now, either way, it says, so Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Ararur as far as Minith, 20 cities, and to Abel Karamim with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of God. When Jephthah came to his house at Mitzpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. There's no way for him to carry on his legacy at all without her. Even with her, it would be through being an in-law, not a direct descendant, right? All right. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you've given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. So he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Okay, now, things to understand about this. First of all, okay, so, First of all, when we look at how does God feel about child sacrifice, first of all? Well, Leviticus 18.21 says this. My bookmarks have fallen. Leviticus 18.21 says this. And then chapter 20, verses 2 through 5, Deuteronomy 12.31 and Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12 all say the same as Leviticus 18, 21, which is this. Um, and you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Um, let, me, let me do uh, 22 through 5. It says this. Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel... Who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people, because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. 
And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, they, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family. I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. What would they do with Molech? Molech had a belly that was an oven that they would offer their children to him and stick them in that oven and kill their kids. Um, so this is talking about child sacrifice. Um, and God is saying, you will be cut off from my people if you do that. Deuteronomy 12, 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Okay, so is God for child, child sacrifice? So if a prophet or a judge makes a vow to God saying, I will give you child sacrifice if you let me win this war, do you think God's gonna go, that's a good deal? No, I think God would give that guy success when he vowed to sacrifice a child to him? No. So we understand the heart of God on this, first of all. Now, Exodus 38, 8 and 2 Samuel 2, 22 gives us some insight into what's probably going on here. Exodus 38, 8 says this. He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So there's these serving women who serve at the tabernacle, okay? And this is likely what he vowed to God, that whoever comes out to greet him would be given over to the service of God. Because what does she mourn and what does she grieve when she gets the news of this vow? She grieving her death? She's grieving, grieving her virginity, right? I will die a virgin. Okay, she's not grieving that she'll die. She's grieving that she'll never have kids. And the tragedy of the story is he has no other child. This is the end of the line for them. Okay? He's not going to have any grandchild at all to carry on his legacy. That just got canceled in this vow. Okay? So he's turning her over to that. That's why she's grieving her virginity. And <clears throat> the Hebrew of the last verse, it says... It became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. Um, the Hebrew makes it much clearer in this. It's they are going to her to lament her virginity four days every year while she's alive. So in other words, this girl's alive and they're going four days a year to lament her virginity with her. Now... Okay, so and a better understanding of this that allows it to be a vow that God would honor just like he honored Hannah's vow. Hannah had a very similar vow. If you give me a child, I'll offer him up in service to you for his life, right? This is the vow that Jephthah made. I'm going to turn over the first one that comes to me and he, his grief is over the fact that it happens to be the member of his family that, that because it's her, he'll have no legacy whatsoever. Okay, it's a far different understanding of the story, correct? That fits the character of God, correct? Fits the character of God. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, third story. This is probably one of the most common complaints about God in the Bible. It's about the wiping out of the Canaanites. Okay, so now, as you know, we have in the Torah and we have in the book of Joshua this warfare where they have to remove the people from the land, correct? Now, here's what we're to understand about that. Genesis 1 and 2 is about creation. Genesis 3 is about the fall of man. Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9 is about the flood being a consequence for the increasing sinfulness of mankind since the fall. And then 6, 7, 8, 9 is about the flood. Genesis 11 is renewed rebellion against Noah's descendants. So Noah and his, Noah's sons start repopulating the world. They become so rebellious. Tower of Babel happens, confused languages. Everything is rebellion, rebellion, rebellion ever since Genesis 3. Now, Genesis 12 
we get this promise to Abraham. After all of that, we get this promise to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, he promises him land. Abraham's going to be promised land. But God is going to say to him that it's going to be 400 years before you can take that land. And he says, know very well that your descendants will be slaves in Egypt during those 400 years because I can't give you the Canaanites' land until 400 years are up because it's going to take that long for their sin to be full. In other words, God will not re repossess the land from the Canaanites until they deserve it. They're not going to have it taken from them until their sin makes it just for them to be removed from the land. So God waits until the behavior is so bad and it's going to take 400 years. And if you know the Canaanites, we already talked about child sacrifice. They had temple prostitution and all kinds of sex sexual debauchery. It's a good thing we don't. And God's going to wait 400 years until it's just for them to remove the land, from the, remove them from the land. God promised this land knowing that it would be inhabited by sinful people, demon worship, sexual debauchery, child sacrifice. Yet the balancing the scales of justice would require that God's people would have to wait 400 plus years for their sins to be full. This shows us that God would not give the land he promised them over to them until it was just to do it. God was emphasizing the wickedness of the inhabitants and his promise to Abraham, Deuteronomy 9, verses 4 and 5. So before we talk about removing the Canaanites from the land, look at Deuteronomy 9, 4 and 5. It says, do not think in your heart, he's talking to his people, do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. First of all, what's the language God is using about the removal of the Canaanites from the land? Drive them out, correct? The consistent language first is always remove them. It's not annihilate them or kill them. It's dis there, you are to dispossess their land. He says, it's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out be from before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because you are righteous, but because you are a stiff-necked people. All right, so God was emphasizing the wickedness of the inhabitants of the land is why they are going to be removed. In other words, this is justice. This is just. It would be unjust for them to have this land and behave the way that they're behaving because kids are dying. Their sexual lives are completely ignoring the holiness of that act and it's now just given over to their own uh, temporary pleasures instead and they're worshiping false gods and demons. So he says that you do that for 400 years, you're going to lose your land. Okay. Now, in Exodus 23, when before, before they even get to this point of the war, here's what God says about them taking over this land. Exodus 23, starting in verse 27, God says, I will send my fear before you, and I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Now, that's not language of wiping them out and killing them, right? Turning their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which will drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous from you, for you. Little by little, I will drive them out. Do you hear the language? Okay. So when people say, why does God commit genocide and just wipe people out off the face of the earth and kill them all? 
That was not the original plan, right? The original plan is you're to remove them from the land. God himself will drive them out. And he says, and I will set your bounds from the Red Sea uh, from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the, of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. How can you make a covenant with people you're called to kill? See what I'm saying? Okay. And they, they shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God's more worried about them serving their gods, and they have to be alive to have gods to serve, right? So this is the initial instructions to the Israelites about taking possession of the land. It's never starting with, hey, go kill them all, as is the accusation against God here. In fact, look at Deuteronomy chapter 20. In Deuteronomy 20, it says this. God's preparing them for the wars that they're going to fight. It says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, hear, O Israel, today you're on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then the officer shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go return to his house. In other words, it's like a Gideon thing. Listen, if you built the house or you got a new wife or you're afraid, don't fight. Go home. God's saying, I'm going to fight this battle for you. I really don't need anybody. So he's letting the army shrink down, okay? Then he says this, when you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open up to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. So what's the first thing they're to do when they come across these cities along the way? Offer them peace. Listen, Rahab offered spies peace, a peaceful solution for her and her family, correct? Did they take it? They took the offer of peace with Rahab and her family, didn't they? Okay? So God's first intention is remove them from the land. And people might say, well, then where are they going to go? I don't know. All I know this is this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make it harder for them to kill their own kids. It's going to make it harder for them to go, the demons I worship are really coming through for me, right? It's going to straighten them out, hopefully a lot, okay? But then we get this. First of all, let me look at uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 9.1. We did 9, 4, and 5. Now look at the first verse of Deuteronomy 9. Hear, O Israel, you're to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess the nations greater and mightier than yourself, um, cities that are great and fortified up to heaven. So what are they to do? Dispossess the nations. All right. They're to pursue peace before engaging in war. Now, if God were an angry, bloodthirsty warmonger, as Richard Dawkins calls them, then when God came to earth in the form of, the ma of a man, what should we expect to him to be like? Right? In other words, how we see Jesus in the New Testament is how we should see God in the Old Testament. Okay? Why are the Canaanites not allowed to stay in their land? Is it because God just said, I like these people better and you're out now? No. He says... My people that I love are going to have to stay in Egypt and serve Egyptians for 400 years because it wouldn't be right to take the land from the people when they've only done 399 years of sin. I got to wait for 400, and then it's like, here's what you deserve for that. Okay, so it's justice to fulfill a promise made to Abraham. And when did God make that promise to Abraham? After continued, continued increased wickedness of the people. 
And then God comes forth with a promise of starting with Abraham, starting a nation. That nation will serve as a priest to the other nations. In other words, if Israel is obedient to God in this covenant, then the blessings that they will have will bring all the nations of the world under the lordship of God because they'll realize that he's the true God based on those blessings. But the problem with Genesis 12 all the way through Malachi is that they're never obedient. They're stiff-necked, hard-hearted. So then God goes with a plan that can't possibly fail. He's going to send his son to be perfectly obedient. Since Israel couldn't do it, his son will do it. And then he says, all you have to do now is believe. What a warmongering God we have. All you have to do is believe. Believe in what? The punishment that you deserve, like the Canaanites. Listen, God said, offer them peace. And I didn't keep reading, but it says, if they reject that peace offer, offer and instead make war against you, then wipe them out. Because what's the only other option than wiping them out when you're at war? Be wiped out, right? It's the only other option, okay? So the Canaanites. All right, I think we can do this. Let's finish up with um, one of my favorites. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 2, talk about Elisha and the she-bears. Sounds like a musical group. Elisha and the she-bears. All right. All right, let's start from... Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. All right, we have time. Let's, let's do the chapter here. We'll skip some of it, but here we go. All right, so 2 Kings chapter 2, it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophet who were at Bethel came out to Elisha. And said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophet who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, so the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. By the way, anybody know how many miracles Elijah performed in his ministry? Half as many as Elisha. Elijah did seven. Elisha did 14. Right? And what did Elisha ask for? Okay. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So did he see it? He saw it. All right? So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had, when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master 
lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them. Therefore they sent 50 men and they searched for three days but did not find him. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. They went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it, there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. So he turned around, looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. All right. Now, <laughs> have you ever seen any artwork about this story? It's grotesque. Okay? Kids chewed up and bleeding to death on the ground. Okay? So is that what this story is talking about? Well... The word translated youth there is na'ar katan. It means little children is how it's translated here. But na'ar katan is also used of baby Moses. But it's also used of the adult Absalom. Absalom was called a na'ar katan. And was Hadam, the, re the rebel Hadam the Edomite, was called a na'ar katan as an adult. So... Na'ar katan, not just, it, it can be translated little children, but it also refers to servants. The young men who accompanied Isaac up the hill of his sacrifice were called na'ar katans. The armor bearers of Abimelech, who you would clearly have as your armor bearers, boys that are at least full strength, like in their 20s. And they are called na'ar katans. When, when um, Abimelech had the millstone thrown on his head and he didn't want a woman taking credit for his death and he asked his armor bearer to pierce him through, that armor bearer was called a nar katan. Okay? Uh, we see king's officials called nar katans and servants of priests called nar katans. So it's certainly not limited to an understanding of little children. Their behavior is that of little children, and that probably drives the translation because they're mocking like a little child would mock. These are likely 20-somethings who serve the priesthood of Baal because they are in uh, a place that's been turned over to Baal worship. Bethel was one of the two places Jeroboam set up as idolatrous centers of worship. Bethel and Dan as Jeroboam takes over the northern kingdom of Israel and he's worried that his citizens of the northern kingdom might want to go and worship at the temple in Jerusalem in the south and if they go to the south and worship at that temple he's afraid they'll stay because they got the temple there so to entice them not to go to Jerusalem to the temple he sets up in Dan and in Bethel in the northern kingdom uh, temples of worship and, 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 and idols to worship. And that evolves into Baal worship. So they started worshiping Baal there. These are very likely servants in those false temples. And what are they actually saying? They're saying to Elisha, go up, bald head, go up, bald head. Now, a balding head was usually a sign of a curse. And you're wondering why you're listening to me. Well, not fully cursed yet. It's just working its way through. <laughs> There's some cursed people out there, though. I see. Okay. But anyways, um, and when they're saying go up, go up, they're talking about their joy over Elijah, the prophet of the true God, not being around anymore, and they want Elisha to leave too. So they do not want a prophet of God in their presence 
they're, they're glad the first one left and they want this one to go as well. They're encouraging him to disappear, to get out of their lives, get out of their city. So they're rejecting the prophet of God, which is certainly the equivalent of doing what? Rejecting God, right? So now what they should have learned, because remember, we're to learn from our parents, right? How did God drive out the Canaanites that I read to you? He says, I will send the hornet ahead to drive out the Hivites, correct? So God used those animals to drive them out. So here again, he's using animals to drive out the false prophets of God, these, these idol-worshiping, uh, God-rejecting uh, prophets or servants in the temple of Baal. So he's using animals to drive them out. Now, so just as Joshua crossed the Jordan on dry land to defeat the idolatrous Canaanites, that should have sufficiently warned these boys that the prophet who just crossed the Jordan on dry land as well would likewise defeat them. As God used the hornet in Canaan, as we read in Exodus 23, so now he used bears in Bethel for the same purpose. So what are we to learn from that? Well, God's not done using animals to drive off and destroy people who reject him and worship false gods. Because if you read through the rest of your Bible, you'll see the very last book of your Bible says the next animal God will choose to do such a thing as a lamb. And it'll be the wrath of the lamb of God that will destroy the enemies of God. So we're to learn from the patterns of Scripture. We see the hornet driving out the Hivites. We see the bears driving out the temple servants of Baal. And eventually those who likewise have false gods will be destroyed by God, by the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so can't imagine any questions coming tonight, but let's pray and uh, see what happens. So if our Father and our God, um, we thank you for your word, Lord. And we thank you that uh, the deep dives into your word, Lord, uh, reveal the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you, Lord, that when you became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we got to get a, we got a much better look at who you are, we see that you don't desire the death of the wicked, Lord. You desire that they turn from their wicked ways and repent and live. And Lord, we realize that as you set that standard of holiness and perfection, you're quick to forgive us, Lord, and to even sacrifice your son, something you didn't even ask Abraham to do. So God, may we see how consistently beautiful and grace-filled you are towards those who believe. And we pray that belief would increase and extend throughout this country, Lord, in an unbelievable fashion that could only be explained by your spirit. And so, Lord, here we are. Send us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.